we finished the chapter on Fourier series. I'm gonna flash my desktop up here so you can keep track. Okay, I'm gonna I'm going to just remind you where we are in the book. Okay, so let's make this a bit bigger. Right, so we've finished Fourier series one and Fourier series two. Fourier series two was about uh, was about, so Fourier series one was, was the simple Fourier series introducing you to the topic Fourier series over domains from minus pi to pi. And then in Fourier series two, we looked at the ideas of convergence and then Fourier series um, from zero to L or, or over other domains like zero to two L and then even and odd extensions, okay? So at, at this point, now we're ready to move on. Now, historically, I've always introduced a chapter 13, Math of Music, and this was previously sort of non-examinable content in which I explained how we use Fourier series to study sound, so signal processing. Um, I'm not sure what to do with that at the moment, but just because of the limitations of the current lectures, I want to move on to, to chapter 14, okay? There is this unknown question of what's going to happen to your exams, which I know you're all anxious about. Um, and the only thing I can say is that we don't know anything about it ourselves. The DOS team doesn't really know anything about it either. We're all waiting for the university to make a decision about the way the exams have to be conducted. And, and obviously, there's a lot of limitations in, in terms of administering it. There's a lot of students who aren't on campus and who aren't in the UK, who are on different time zones. Um, and as you know, it's not going to be on campus, but what format it's going to take um, is up in the air at the moment. So as soon as we find out what's going to happen to that, as soon as I find out what's going to happen to that, um, we'll be able to think about how we want to design the assessment. Um, and we're all, sort of, we, we're all aware of everyone's anxiety and we're all aware of the pressure that's on everybody at the moment, okay? So let's go on now. We're gonna go on to chapter 14, the terminology of PDEs. And essentially what's, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna define the basic terminology of PDEs and then we're going to return back to the heat equation. And we started off with the heat equation a few chapters ago and use that as motivation to derive this whole Fourier series business. Now we're gonna come back and then we're gonna be able to solve these PDEs, okay? I'll also remind you to just to keep track of what's going on the website. Now there are individual lecture summaries. So for instance, lecture 20 and lecture 21. So I write these up um, around, this, around the time that I before I give the, the lecture or slightly after I give the lecture, but it will be reminded to you in the weekend emails. And then finally, you want to also keep track of the errata here, so this link, which um, essentially keeps track of all the errors that we've spotted throughout the term. So people email me with, is this a mistake in the lecture notes? And usually the answer is yes. So for instance, you'll notice that there's a mistake in chapter 15 where I, something should read zero, um, x between zero and pi, uh, instead of what, what's written in the text for x between zero and two. Most of these mistakes are fairly obvious, but it's good just to confirm it on this webpage. So if you do notice a mistake, then just send me an email and I'll add it to the list. Um, and that's basically it. So why don't we get started? I've forgotten all my notes at the university, so I have to ad lib some of this. But we'll do the best that we can. Okay. Uh, okay. Right, so where are we? So we want to return to PDEs. Okay, and we want to define some of the terminology um, that includes words like boundary value problems, words like uh, boundary conditions and initial conditions. And I'm gonna define it in terms of an example, okay? If you read the chapter notes, you'll, you'll quickly get bogged down with all these definitions and you don't have to know the definitions, right? 
what we're going to be doing is a lot of practice problems. So a lot of these terms like boundary conditions and initial conditions, you'll see them in the context of actual problems. Okay, but let's write down the toy problem that we want to consider. Okay, so we want to consider. I have to write quite small. So we want to consider. Okay, they're called boundary value problems. So BVP. Boundary value problems um, defined with initial conditions and boundary conditions, right? So we call them ICs for initial conditions. Okay, and uh, boundary conditions and BCs. Okay, and so let's write down a simple toy PDE. Okay, so we are going to have a heat equation. So UT is equal to kappa UXX. Okay, so here kappa is the heat parameter. X here is defined between 0 and L. And T is time, so that will be greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So this is the main equation to solve. U here is a function of X and T, and we need initial conditions and boundary conditions to specify. Okay? So I need a boundary condition. So let's write U of zero and T. The temperature on the left is equal to zero, and that's the temperature on the right as well. Okay, so these are the boundary conditions. Okay, and in addition to this, you need to tell me where the temperature begins, right? So we need to say that u at x and t is equal to zero is equal to some specified temperature f of x, okay? How do you imagine this? Well, you imagine a bar of heat. Here is your one-dimensional bar. This is an x. This is at zero and L. Okay, you're going to fix the temperature at this end to be zero. You'll fix the temperature at this end to be zero. And then you're going to specify that at time t is equal to zero, this will begin from some given heat distribution. Okay, so this f of x it might be something like a constant, it might just be one everywhere, so the temperature begins at one everywhere, or it might be something a little bit more complicated. Okay? There are other boundary conditions that you can investigate. Okay? So you might not set it to be zero, you might set it to be some other constant. Maybe it's a boundary condition that varies as a function of time. Okay? Or maybe you don't specify in terms of u, you specify in terms of the derivative of u. Okay, so there are other variations of this problem, but in essence, this is what we call a boundary value problem. A boundary value problem is a PDE coupled with boundary conditions and initial conditions. Okay, now you look at this thing and you say, well, how did, I, how did you know that these are the conditions I need to solve the problem? So for instance, how do you know that you, all, you need two boundary conditions on uh, x equal to zero and x equal to, to L? What if you only gave one, okay? Or how did you know that you only need one initial condition for u and not one for the derivative? Okay, so these are very good questions. The question of the sufficiency, so these are all very good questions. The question of how many boundary conditions you need and the sufficiency of the bound, boundary conditions you have to determine the solution. And it's actually not that obvious, okay? So the, the, the answer to that question, well, how many boundary conditions you need and, and is it sufficient to determine the solution? That's not an obvious, um, that's not quite a trivial question. 
in this course, we don't really talk about that question. We're not going to really talk about you know, the, 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 the rigorous theory of the boundary conditions and initial conditions, we're going to mainly depend on our intuition. So it makes sense that if I ask for the distribution of heat in a bar, then I'm going to have to tell you something about the end, and I'm going to have to tell you about something um, in the temperature in which it begins, okay? If we were trying to model a wave equation, which is the other PDE that we look at in this course, then there'll be different types of boundary conditions, and different types of initial conditions that you need to consider in light of the physical phenomena. Okay? Okay, so that covers the main terminology BVPs, ICs, and DCs. Okay? So now the question um, now, before I go on to actually talk about the solution of this equation, let's talk about what types of boundary conditions there are. Okay? And essentially, there are three types that you have to know there is Dirichlet conditions. There's Neumann conditions and there's mixed conditions. Okay, Dirichlet conditions are conditions that set the value of the function on the boundary, and in this case, the boundary is at zero and L. Okay, remember that this is a one-dimensional bar, and you don't think of the boundary on the top; you just think of the boundary at x equal to zero and at x equal to L. Okay, so a Dirichlet condition is a condition that sets the value of u. A Neumann condition is a condition that sets the derivative of u at the boundary, and then a mixed condition is one that combines the two. Okay, so let's write that down. Because the board is so small, I have to be careful about how much I write. So I'm going to be writing a lot less than how much I usually do. Okay. So uh, there are three types of boundary conditions. Okay. Um, the first one is a Dirichlet condition. So a Dirichlet condition. In a Dirichlet condition, you're going to specify the value of the function on the boundary. Okay, so suppose that my boundary, I'm going to consider something a little bit more general than this here. Let's consider the solution of a problem where the boundary, let's call that partial D for the boundary. So the domain is this region here. This is the boundary of the domain. And so for the Dirichlet condition, you're going to specify the value of the function, the unknown PDE function, on the boundary of the domain. So here, you're going to specify u of x and t equal to some function, h of x, on the boundary, like that. Okay, so in this course, we're not going to look at very complicated boundaries. In fact, most of the PDs that we investigate will be on the real line, on a one-dimensional line. So the boundary is only two points if it's a line, 0 and L. Okay, If you have a square, then the boundary will be the boundary of the square. So here we're saying that we're going to specify the value of the function is some function h of x. You can be more complicated than this. Your h can also depend on t, okay? But we're not going to study those complicated examples. The important thing for you to understand is what a Dirichlet condition is, okay? Then the next condition is a Neumann condition, okay? So a Neumann condition is that I'm going to specify the value of the normal derivative of the function on the boundary, okay? So um, du dn. Okay, is, and you'll have to refer to one of the problem set questions of how to calculate what this is. This is just the rate of change of your function in the normal direction. And in one of the problem sets, is explained that you can calculate this by taking the gradient of u dot n. 
And so we're saying that I'm going to specify that value, right? I'm going to give you that value, or rather, you have to make sure that whatever solution you find satisfies that value on the boundary. Okay, that's what a Neumann condition is. And then finally, you have a mixed condition. So in the mixed condition, you're going to specify some combination of the function value u and the normal derivative. So for instance, I'm going to specify, let's say, alpha of x times u plus beta of x times du dn is h of x, like so, on the boundary. OK? Right. So these are the main three types of boundary conditions that you have to know. Okay. And then there's two types in addition to the Dirichlet, Neumann, and mixed conditions. There's a terminology that we'll use depending on whether this h of x on the right hand side is zero. Okay. If h of x is zero, okay, so if h of x is zero, then we say that this is a homogeneous boundary condition. This is a homogeneous boundary condition. If h of x is not equal to zero, then it's inhomogeneous or inhomogeneous. Okay, so that's basically all you need to know about boundary conditions. Dirichlet, set the function value. Neumann, set the normal derivative. Mix, set some combination. If the right-hand side is zero, that is to say that if u, for, for instance, is set to be zero on the boundary, this is what's called a homogeneous boundary condition. If it's not zero, it's inhomogeneous. Okay, now this is formulated for more general domains, right? This partial d function for the case of one dimensional domains, which is what we're mostly concerned about, right? Then this boils down to something much more, uh, much more simple, right? So let's write that down for the case of one dimensional, just so you can understand um, what we're working with. If it's a one dimensional domain, then it's just a line, okay? And so when I specify the value of u on the boundary, this is equivalent to specifying u at, say, 0 and t equal to a constant, c1, and u at l and t equal to another constant, c2. Okay, that's the case of a Neumann condition for a one-dimensional boundary. If you have a, uh, sorry, that's the case of a Dirichlet condition for a one-dimensional boundary. For the case of a Neumann condition, the normal derivative on the boundary of a line is just the x derivative. That's the normal direction, right? So this condition would be replaced, the Neumann condition for a one-dimensional domain would be replaced with du dx at 0 and t equal to, say, one constant, and then du dx and at L and T equal to another constant. Okay? And then the mixed condition you can imagine is some combination of those two. So say alpha times U plus beta times du dx is another constant, and then the same thing on the other side. So in the case of a one-dimensional domain, remember that it, it's at two points. Okay? For a general two-dimensional domain, it'd be something much more complicated. If c1 is equal to 0 and c2 is equal to 0, it's a homogeneous boundary condition. And similarly with the c1 and c2 for the Neumann condition. Okay, that's all you have to know about terminology, really. You've got boundary value problems. You've got boundary conditions. You've got initial conditions. You've got Dirichlet, Neumann, and mixed boundary conditions. You've got homogeneous and inhomogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, we're going to return now to study the, the, the heat equation, but before we do that, I want to remind you something about linearity. Okay.
So all of the PDEs that you learn about here in this course are linear. Okay? And in fact, you, you might say that all the differential equations you really learn about at university are virtually all linear. Okay? And if they're linear, then you know a lot about the solution structure. If you have a linear PDE or a linear differential equation, If you have a linear PDE or a linear differential equation, then you know that if you have one solution, say a u, you can add that to another solution, say v, and then u plus v will be a solution. Similarly, you can form linear combinations and so forth and so on. Okay, so there's a lot of structure in linear differential equations, in linear partial differential equations, and ordinary differential equations, and it turns out to be much simpler to study these than the case of nonlinear problems. And so if you go and you flip through a lot of your differential equations textbooks and your differential equations theory, you'll find out it's almost virtually all about linear problems. Nonlinear problems are much more difficult, and all the solution techniques that you learn, in a sense, you kind of have to throw them out the window for nonlinear problems. We have, we're much more limited in our ability to study nonlinear problems than linear problems, okay? And so why, why am I telling you this? Well, the method that we're using to construct solutions of the PDEs depends crucially on the fact that it's a linear PDE, right? So for instance, if you know that a cosine is a solution and a sine is a solution, then you can add the two and you can form another solution. And so that's the whole idea behind Fourier series. If you can form this general solution in terms of sums of individual solutions, okay? So that's linear PDE theory, and now we know the basic terminology. Now we're going to return to study the heat equation. We began this study um, two chapters ago before we did the Fourier theory. Now let's return with you know, fresh eyes and, and a background on Fourier series, and we can find that we can solve these types of problems. Okay? Um, so I want, to study the, I want to study the differential equation that I wrote down before. Um, I'm going to erase this top line here. And then I'll, I'll have to kind of write it in a, in, a, in a shortened form, so I'll do it here. So this is the problem that we want to study. Ut is equal to kappa uxx, okay? Just for example, I'm going to set the boundaries at zero and pi. Okay, so let's do the theory for zero and pi rather than zero and L. Okay, and I'm going to set that u at zero and t should be zero. Set the temperature to be zero on the left and set the temperature to be zero on the right. And I'm going to specify that let's start at a distribution f of x. So I'm going to specify that at initial time, at x and 0, this is f of x, but in fact, I'm going to set this to be 1 in a moment. So that's just my toy problem. I want to consider a bar of heat, which is heated to a, a temperature of 1 everywhere, and then at its ends, we're going to set the end temperatures to be 0. Okay, so let's solve this problem. And you solve this problem through separation of variables. And we did this theory, I know we did it two chapters ago, but I've forgotten by now, so I'd like us to just do it again. Okay, so the, the, the basic idea is to write down the solution in terms of a separable form. So let's call that step one. So step one is let's let u of x t be equal to capital X of x times capital T of t. Okay, step two, you substitute, well, you, you, you substitute this, let's keep, still keep it step one, you substitute this into the PDE, and what do you get? Well, you get one time derivative on the left, two x derivatives on the right. So you're going to have a t prime times an x is equal to x double prime times a t times a kappa. Okay, then you move the kappa over to the left-hand side. Um, you don't have to do this. I prefer to do it just to keep the capital with the time. 
you move the kappa over the other side, you separate it, so you move all the functions of x over to one side, all the functions of t over to the other side. And uh, we have this, kappa times t is equal to x double prime over x, like this. Okay, and this here on the left is a function of t, this here on the right is a function of x, and the only way you can have this is if both sides are equal to a constant. So I'm going to set this to be equal to, let me call this a constant um, sigma, a constant, okay? And I want to argue, in fact, this sigma has to be less than or equal to zero. In fact, less than zero are the relevant ones. Okay? Someone in the chat has asked, are there solutions that aren't separable? And that, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes, there are absolutely solutions that aren't separable, but those are much harder to do. Right? So all the techniques we have are for problems in which it's separable, and it's a very good question of, well, what's a simple problem for which it's not separable? And um, maybe we'll come back and readdress that. So basically, any problem where you have complicated boundaries, so for example, let's say you're trying to find the heat equation or solve for the heat flow in a domain that's not something like a circle, or a square, so it's something with a complicated boundary. In that case, you're not expecting a separable solution, and usually what you have to do is you have to do it numerically. So these kind of methods only work if the domain is sufficiently simple. If it's, for example, a line from zero to L, or a square, or a circle, or an annular region. Okay, so I, I wanna argue about the different cases of sigma here. Okay, so let's, let's call that step two. Okay. Now, the case that you have to know and kind of jump to once you understand this method is that sigma is less than zero. So let's call that case one. Sigma is equal to minus lambda squared, and let's say this is less than zero. Okay. And this case turns out to be the relevant one, but I want to show it carefully in this demonstration. I want to go through all the possibilities of what sigma has to be, okay? So you substitute this minus lambda squared into this right-hand side, and then you solve for the t's and solve for the x's. Okay, so let's do that together. So you've got t prime is equal to minus uh, kappa times lambda squared times t, and you've got x double prime is equal to minus, uh, minus lambda squared times x. Okay, I'm gonna to jump to the solutions. I have very limited board space here, so I'm gonna jump right to the solutions here. If you don't know how to solve these two equations, then you should go away and look them up. This is just um, in your elementary differential equations textbooks, but we're expecting for you to be able to solve these equations, okay? So this one here will tell you that t of t has to be a constant, let's call this constant c, an exponential of minus lambda squared kappa times t, like so. Okay, and then this problem here for x will be two oscillatory solutions, a sine and then a cosine. So this will tell you that x of x will be a times cosine of lambda times x plus b times sine of lambda times x. Okay, good. Now, why does this solution look good? Well, the first thing is that the time term here is an exponential decay, which is sort of what you expect for heat flow. You expect heat in general to decay, to diffuse, right? If I begin with a hot bar, then in general, the solution should um, decrease in time. And that's, what, that's why you, you're expecting this constant to be negative. We're gonna do the case where the constant is positive, the sigma is positive in a minute, and instead of this, you'd have exponential growth, which doesn't make much sense for a bar of heat, right? If this was exponentially growing, then your heat would be unbounded in time. It's basically a bar which is being held at zero temperature on the left and on the right, and the temperature is actually increasing without any forcing in the system. Okay. So, the next thing is you have to impose boundary conditions on this problem. Okay, so we have two boundary conditions to impose, a zero on the left and zero on the right. And the two boundary conditions 
will will tell you that if u, for instance, is 0 on the left and on the right, that x at 0 times t as a function of t has to be 0. And so therefore, unless your t of t is 0, which would be pretty bad because then you just end up with a trivial solution, then x of 0 has to be 0. And then the second boundary condition is argued in the same way. If x of pi times t of t is equal to 0, then x at pi is equal to 0. OK? Good. So now you impose these two boundary conditions in there. Notice I've not done anything about the initial condition. So I have a final condition here, which I'm going to leave to last for reasons which become clear. Let's impose these two boundary conditions. Okay, so you're going to substitute 0 into this function here. And if you substitute x equal to 0 into here, you have a times 1 plus b times 0. So that tells you a has to be 0. So a times 1 plus b times 0 is 0. So that tells you a has to be 0. And then finally, you have to substitute pi into this function here. So you have a times cos of lambda times pi. Uh, plus b times sine of lambda times pi, but a is 0. So when you substitute pi into it, this will tell you that b times sine of lambda times pi is equal to 0. Okay, so now either b is equal to 0, in which case it's trivial, because both a and b are 0, and you're left with the trivial solution, uh, u is equal to 0, or lambda times pi is equal to 0. So here, you conclude that, um, let's do that here. So therefore, lambda times pi is equal to n times pi um, if a is not equal to 0. Oh, off screen. OK, so this says lambda times pi is equal to n times pi if a is not equal to 0, and therefore that tells you that lambda is equal to n. Okay, therefore lambda is equal to n. Okay, so at that point, you're basically done. I'm going to erase this line, we're going to write the final conclusion for this particular case, and then we're going to go on to the next case. Do I mean that b is equal to n? Absolutely, thank you. Okay, so if b is not equal to 0. Okay, so from this case, if you use blackboard paint, apparently you're supposed to wait a day for it to dry. I didn't do that because I finished painting it. 10 p.m. yesterday. No idea what's going to happen to my wall. Okay, so uh, therefore, from this case, you concluded that we find solutions of, um, we're going to index them with an n, okay? So we're going to call them un of x and p, okay? is essentially um, c times an exponential of minus lambda n squared kappa times t. It's going to be a bit long-winded. And then you have a function of x that you have to put in. So this will be a b times a sine of lambda um, n times x, like so. And remember the lambdas that we found were equal to n. So lambda n is equal to n. Um, which are all integers, okay? So now you're going to combine the b and the c together, and this I'm, I'm just going to index this with a bn, like so. So bn times an exponential minus lambda n squared times t times a sine of lambda n times x, like so, and then lambda n is equal to that thing there. So any thing that you put in here, with any n being an integer, so just n times x, and then minus n squared times t, and we're missing a kappa here. 
will be a solution, okay? And the key is that eventually we're gonna just add them all together and form a general solution, okay? Why does B get indexed? Um, these BNs are, they, they are just constants, okay? So this is just, a, we're, we're calling, we're saying that for a different value of lambda here, given a different value of lambda, we're gonna associate that with a different constant BN. Okay, but it's just a notate. It's just for notation. Say these are indeed constants. Okay, and we've combined the b and the c constant together to be one constant. Um, now, in addition to this, let's think about the, the different cases of n being negative and possibly n being zero. Okay, so firstly, if n is negative, then you'll notice that if I put a negative number into the sign then it's just coming out here because sine is an odd function. So you put a negative number here, you move the negative out, and then it can be absorbed in the constant the end. Okay? So it, without loss of generality, we can then limit ourselves only to the positive integers, okay? which leaves the case of lambda n equal to zero, the case of n is equal to zero. But if lambda n is equal to zero, then this constant sigma here, which we define to be minus lambda squared, is equal to zero. So we just have to treat that case separately. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, in conclusion, you'd say that basically this is the general solution. So the, the, sorry, that's not the general solution. This, these are the general separable solutions for this case where lambda n is equal to n over the positive integers. You only have to uh, worry about the positive integers. Okay, so a lot of people are asking about this question of 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 um, lambda n and and, and uh, sorry. a lot of people are asking about this question about lambda and instead of lambda lambda n instead of lambda. This is just a notation thing. I'm going to call instead of saying that I have constants lambda, which can take values of n. I'm just going to index them with a subindex n here. So this is still a constant lambda n. Okay. Okay, so um, this covers this case here. Let's do the next case. So we have two other cases to consider. The case where sigma is equal to zero and the case where sigma is greater than zero. So the next case, let's call that item. I don't want to. I want to keep it as item two. Case two is the case where sigma is equal to zero. Okay. And well, what happens in that case? Well, in that case, unfortunately, I've erased the um, PDEs that you have to solve or the ODEs that you have to solve. But in that case you essentially have to solve t prime is equal to zero and x prime, x double prime is equal to zero. If you go back to the line that we erased and you, you substitute in sigma is equal to zero, these are the two differential equations you need to solve, okay? And so this condition here tells you that basically t of t is constant, let's call that c, and then this condition just tells you that x is linear. So this condition tells you that x of x is ax plus b. Okay, so now you impose the same boundary conditions as before. So boundary conditions, the first one tells you that x of zero should be zero, right? And that tells you that just b is equal to zero. And then the second boundary condition tells you that x of pi is zero, and that just tells you that essentially a is equal to zero. So you've essentially concluded that at this point the sigma equal to zero case leads to the trivial solution as well. So only u is equal to zero. So this is trivial. Just to be clear um, about this, this issue of trivial solutions, 
it's a trivial solution in the sense that if I look at this ODE that sorry this PD that I have to solve the heat equation with the ends kept at zero, only in the case where the initial condition is completely trivial, u is equal to zero, will this be a solution, right? So um, sorry, I'm, I'm stating it like it, it, it's, it's slightly obvious, but it should be slightly obvious. You're looking at the heat distribution in a bar in which the ends are being kept at zero temperature, okay? The only way that u being zero, the temperature being zero for all time and for all space is a solution is if the bar itself is initially set to be zero temperature. Okay, so th that's exactly what, so someone has asked, well, how do you have u is equal to zero when u of x and zero is equal to one we've written here? And that's my point, I'm saying that you don't, right? This solution would, would, would the trivial solution is not a solution with this initial condition. It doesn't make any sense for it to be. Okay. Right, so we've covered case one. We've covered now case two. That leaves the last case. And the last case is this sigma, this constant is positive. So let's replace that with case three here. Okay, so here. And then my sigma then is lambda squared, which is greater than zero. Okay. And then now again, you're going to go and try to write down the two differential equations you have to solve. Okay, the first one will be basically um, t prime is equal to minus is equal to plus lambda squared times kappa times t, and then the second one will be x double prime is equal to lambda squared times x. It's, it's the only difference is that this, these are both plus instead of negative as they were in case one. In this case, I have t of t is equal to a constant times an exponential of lambda squared kappa times t. And in the second case, so now you have to go and think, oh, what happens if I have a second order differential equation with a positive right-hand side? In that case, you have two exponentials. Okay, so again, refer to your differential equations textbooks if you a bit um, if you can't remember how to solve these types of problems. So in this case, I have the exponential of lambda times x plus b times the exponential of minus lambda times x. Okay. Right. So this first line is rather suspicious, right? This is exactly what I'm saying, that it, had you written down this line, you should be suspicious because this is predicting exponential growth of the temperature. So this would tell you that u of x and t would tend to infinity as t goes to infinity, which doesn't make any sense. This is a bar of heat being held at zero temperatures on either end with some initial conditions. It doesn't make much sense to have a solution which is unbounded in time, right? But you can show that in fact, uh, even without that physical intuition, you just end up with a trivial solution. So you just impose the boundary conditions on this x problem. So x of 0 being 0 tells you that a plus b has to be 0. And then you have x of pi being 0 tells you that a times the exponential of lambda times pi plus b times the exponential of minus lambda times pi is zero. Okay, and the only solution of this problem is if both a and b are equal to zero. Yes, thank you. So um, a little bit of discussion here about the sign of kappa. Kappa here is always positive, sorry. So in the heat equation, the heat parameter kappa is always positive. And that goes, uh, boils down to the, the physical definition of the physical constants, okay? So this tells you that A is equal to B is equal to zero. Okay, I should say that, I should say that the other way of doing this is with hyperbolic functions, with a cosh and a cinch. Um, and if that interests you, then you should look into it, but don't worry about it if, if you can't remember your cosh and cinch. Functions, okay, so the point here is that if you put these two boundary conditions into the this expression for x of x, for big x of little x, 
you should just end up with a trivial solution. Okay, so now you're convinced that the only case that was relevant, that was truly relevant, was the case that the sigma was less than zero. So now we're ready to try to write down the solution, the, the full solution. Okay, so what do you know at this point? Well, you know that if there are separable solutions, then you know that the form of those separable solutions have to be um, these things that involve the bn's times e to the minus lambda squared kappa t times sine of the function, right? But the problem is that even using these individual solutions, you won't be able to, set, to satisfy this condition, right? So if you're to substitute t is equal to zero into the solutions that you found, you'll simply be left with signs, and a sign is not equal to one. And so the only way you can form a solution that satisfies this initial condition is to form this Fourier series. Okay, so the general, so this is item number three. The general solution We're going to add all the solutions that we found before. And this comes from the linearity of the problem, right? The problem is linear. You can always add combinations of these solutions. So we're going to form a general solution, u of x and t, equal to a sum from 1 to infinity of the solutions we found previously. And the proofs we found previously were um, bn times the exponential of minus lambda n squared kappa t times sine of lambda n times x, where lambda n comma lambda n here is equal to n. Okay, so this is, you, we've added together all the separable solutions as before, and then now the only thing we have to do is satisfy this condition, and then we're done. But we have to find the bn coefficients that allow us to satisfy that condition, right? But we need u at x and 0, and now you put in t is equal to 0 into this expression here, see? There's 1 to infinity, there's bn. This is just e to the 0 is 1, so that's sine, and then let's go ahead and write this lambda n as n. There you are. Okay, so we need this essentially to be equal to 1, right? And then now we know how to do that. We have our Fourier series business. Is there any reason to keep on writing lambda n? So someone had asked, why, why should we write lambda n? There's no reason. You could have substituted this n into here. I sometimes just do it just to remind you that lambda n, um, no, there's no reason to. So if the lambda n is more complicated, so for problems over 0 to L, instead this would be um, n pi x over L, so this would be n pi x over L, then it makes sense to write lambda n because this expression is a little bit more simple. But there's no reason for you to do that. You could go ahead and substitute the n in here at any point. Okay, so now we have to satisfy this, and this is just the Fourier series, but we just have to remind ourselves, oh, how do the coefficients bn are, are calculated? Okay, um, we're, we're gonna go over time, but, but, uh, Given the state of the world, that's probably okay for us to go five minutes over time. I mean, I mean, you're mostly stuck here anyway, so. Okay, so now I need to calculate the BNs, right? So how to calculate the BNs, let's call this item number four. So calculate BN. Right, so how do I do that? Well, I first have to think about what is the thing that I want, okay? I want a function, I'm gonna draw the function for us, okay, this is x here. I need a function which is basically one, from zero to pi. Yeah, I'm gonna draw with the, the negatives here for, for um, reasons you'll see. And I, I need to calculate this bn such that basically one is expressed as a Fourier series here, so as a sum from 1 to infinity of bn times 
times lambda of sine of n times x. Okay? So you look at this thing and you say, well, that's a sine theory. So whatever, um, the, the way that I calculate the coefficients bn should be such that I'm approximating an extension of a function which is basically odd. Because it's the only way that you have, you have to have odd extensions for it to be a pure sine. Right? So if that confuses you, don't worry about it. I'm going to draw the picture and you'll, you'll understand. So I'm going to extend this function so that I'm going to go from minus pi to pi, and I'm going to extend it like so. So this is going to be the odd extension. Okay. But why do you do that? Well, if I do this odd extension, right, forget about the, the original problem. Suppose I told you, go and calculate for me the Fourier sine series of this function here. Right? What would you do? Well, you would basically write down Bn is equal to 2 over pi, the integral from 0 to pi of 1 of sine of nx dx. Okay, these are the Fourier sine coefficients of a function that looks like this. Okay, in other words, the trick to basically finding the coefficients of bn here is to think of this one, which is the, the value of the function you need to um, match from zero to pi, as the odd extension of this more general two pi periodic function. Okay, and then once you've done that, then the bn coefficients just come from the usual theory. Okay, so now um, we're going to end the lecture here. I'm going to start from this point on Thursday. We're going to finish up this problem. I'll show you a numerical solution of this problem on Thursday, and then we'll also solve a more complicated problem where instead of these homogeneous boundary conditions, so you remember I said, well, if the boundary condition is zero, it's homogeneous. We're going to think about the problem in which is inhomogeneous. Okay? Um, and that's it. So I'll see some of you on Thursday. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully I'm going to actually make my blackboard a bit taller. I have to paint more um, above here because it's, it's, it's a bit too small. But uh, let me know if you have any questions going to Thursday's meeting. But otherwise, we'll see you all um, Thursday at 2.15. Okay, bye-bye.